It's been over 10 years since I watched my father and brothers die. 10 years hunting the men responsible. I'm so close to the end now, but no closer to understand what any of it was for. Hello, and welcome to Visions of the Past. This is an Assassin's Creed lore podcast, and my name is Andrew, and I'm grateful to see that you have found this podcast. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the man who gave us that quote, Ezio Auditore da Firenze. First, a little bit about Ezio as he sits in the real world. His first appearance was actually a cameo in the short film Assassin's Creed Lineage, but his first full appearance was in the console game Assassin's Creed 2. He would also star in its direct sequels Assassin's Creed Brotherhood and Assassin's Creed Revelations. Ezio also appeared in side games like Assassin's Creed 2 Discovery for the Nintendo DS, the Facebook game Assassin's Creed Project Legacy, along with a cameo in Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag and Assassin's Creed Chronicles China. The novels of Assassin's Creed Renaissance, Brotherhood, and Revelations, three separate books, were the retellings of the games Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, and Revelations. Ezio also has a brief part within Assassin's Creed The Secret Crusade. On the comic side, Ezio has a very small part in Assassin's Creed Uprising, a storyline in Assassin's Creed Reflections, and he is expected to be in the upcoming Assassin's Creed China. The last thing to mention that he was in, besides the short film of Assassin's Creed Lineage, he was in the other short films Assassin's Creed Embers and Assassin's Creed Ascendants. Ezio is a male Italian name that derives from the Latin name Ateus, which means mother of the Hades. Ateus, in turn, derives from the ancient Greek word Atos, which means eagle. His family name of Auditori is Italian, which means a hearer or listener, and derives as a family name from the professional title that usually belonged to judges. Da Firenze is an identifier of his place of birth, meaning of or from Florence. According to the game manual in Assassin's Creed 2, Ezio is 6 feet tall and weighs 165 pounds. His face model was Francisco Randez, with his voice actor being Roger Craig Smith. Ezio's life would start with his birth in Florence, Italy on June 24th, 1459. Ezio was the second youngest child of Giovanni and Maria Auditore, and for his early life, he would lead one of luxury as a member of the Florentine noble class that came with Giovanni being the head of the Auditore International Bank. During this time, Ezio would be apprenticed to Giovanni Tornabuni, a renowned banker who worked with Giovanni. By 1473, Ezio would be living with his family. At this point, not only did it include his parents and his older brother Federico, but also his younger sister Claudia, and younger brother Petruccio, all were living in Florence. In 1476, Ezio, on the advice of his brother Federico, would introduce himself to Cristina Vespucci. This interaction would lead to Ezio following her home, where he would intervene in an altercation with Vieri de Pazzi. This would end with Vieri swearing vengeance and Cristina thanking Ezio by giving him her name and a kiss. This altercation between Vieri and Ezio led to a fight on the Ponte Vecchio, on December 26th, 1476. Ezio would get a scar on his lip from a rock that Vieri would throw with him, and this scar would stay with him for the rest of his life. After Vieri ran from the Ponte Vecchio, Ezio would see a doctor, and after a race with Federico, would spend the night with Cristina. After being thrown out by Cristina's father, Ezio would return home to be scolded by his father for the fight with Vieri and not coming home, and he asked him to deliver a letter to Lorenzo de' Medici. Two days later, Ezio would run some errands for his little brother and his sister and take some time with his mother and meet Leonardo da Vinci. That night, his father would send him to deliver three letters, and when he got home, he found that the Villa Auditore was ransacked. After being attacked by their housemaid, Annetta, Ezio would have his mother and sister go into hiding with Annetta. Ezio would then go and visit his father and brothers at the Palazzo della Signoria. After climbing the palazzo's facade, Ezio and Giovanni would have a conversation 
I would end with Giovanni telling Ezio to go home, to use his gift, and take everything from a hidden chest, and deliver a sealed letter to Umberto Alberti, a family friend, and the gonfalonieri of Florence. After dressing in the outfit he found, and strapping on the weapons, Ezio would deliver the letter to Alberti, who would offer him shelter for the night. Ezio would decline, instead to visit Cristina. On the next morning, Ezio would return to the Signora to watch as Alberti would decline getting any evidence from Ezio and then ordering the execution of Giovanni, Federico, and Petruccio. Ezio would try to intervene by attempting to kill Alberti, although he would be restrained and ordered to be executed. Ezio would find a way to escape the scene, fleeing to a brothel that was run by Paola, the sister of Annetta, and where his mother and sister were hiding. Paola would agree to help Ezio by teaching him how to survive in the city by pickpocketing and blending into the crowd. The night of the execution, he would meet with Cristina, who would help him recover the bodies of his father and brothers, and he, they would perform their last rites with a pyre. Afterwards, Ezio would ask Christina to leave with him, which she would decline to do so as her duties to her family kept her in Florence. Ezio would respect her decision. On December 30th, 1476, the morning after the execution, Ezio would visit Leonardo da Vinci to repair the hidden blade that Ezio had found within his father's belongings. After thanking Leonardo, Ezio would go on the hunt for Umberto Alberti. He would find him within the courtyard of the Basilica di Santa Croce. Ezio would then murder Alberti in front of the crowd that had gathered for an art exhibit of Andrea del Viracchio. Ezio would then immediately collect his mother and sister from Paola and then leave Florence in hopes to head to Spain. While nearing the Auditori family villa in Monteregione, Vieri de Pazzi would stop them with the intent to kill the rest of the Auditori family. This would be thwarted by Ezio's uncle Mario Auditore, who would not only inform him of the existence of the assassins, along with his father's involvement with them, but of the history of the Templar Order and their involvement, along with how to defend himself. After a year of training, Ezio would deny his family lineage and wish to continue his journey to Spain. Mario would leave Monteregione for the city of San Gimignano after learning that was where Vieri was. Ezio, feeling that it was his fault that Vieri was constantly attacking the area, would follow Mario and arrive in San Gimignano on April 14th, 1478, with the intent to help remove Vieri. After a battle through the city, Ezio would hear a Templar meeting about a scheme against Florence. After this meeting, Ezio would engage Vieri in a duel, eventually killing him. While trying to get information from Vieri about the plot, Vieri would tell him nothing, throwing Ezio into a fit of rage that Mario would remind him that he was not like Vieri or the other Templars. Then Mario gave Vieri his last rites. When Ezio would return to the villa, Five days later, Mario would tell him who the man was that Vieri was talking to, and once Ezio realized that he was also behind the execution of his father and brothers, he decided that he needed to kill every Templar on his father's list. And after Mario explained to him what Altair's codex was and why they looked for its pages, Ezio agreed to look for them as well. Spending the rest of the day learning how to enhance Monteagioni and learn about the sanctuary underneath the villa, uh, Mario would ask him to find hidden tombs across Italy to find a way to retrieve Altair's armor. Ezio would spend the rest of the day learning about how to enhance Monteagioni and learn about the sanctuary under the Auditori Villa, and Mario would ask him to find the hidden tombs across Italy that would allow him to retrieve Altair's armor. Later on in April, Ezio would return to Florence to gather information on what the Pazzi had planned for Florence. He would decide to visit Cristina Vespucci for the first time in two years. He would be informed that Cristina was to be married, thinking that she would never see him again. After hearing about this, Ezio would help Cristina's fiancé with some gamblers that was giving him trouble, and then threaten him to be a good husband to her or he'd hunt him down and kill him. Upon telling Cristina that he made sure her husband would be good to her, he kissed her and was on his way. Next he would see Leonardo da Vinci who would make him another hidden blade, while Ezio practiced new ways to assassinate that they found on the Codex page that Vieri had. After Ezio received his hidden blade, he asked about a man named La Volpe and where to find him. On April 25th, 1478, Ezio would find La Volpe in the Mercado Vecchio and was informed about a secret meeting near the Basilica di Santa Maria Novella. La Volpe would show Ezio a secret entrance to the underground catacombs where the meeting would be held. Ezio would eavesdrop on the meeting about the plans that would be known historically as the Pazzi conspiracy. On his way from the meeting, Ezio would find the statue of Darius and his seal that would eventually be used to gain Altair's armor. Ezio would then arrive at the Duomo on the next morning in an attempt to prevent the public assassination of Lorenzo and Giuliano di Medici. He'd be able to save Lorenzo, but Giuliano would die of the wounds that he had incurred. 
That night, Ezio would find Francesco de Pazzi at the Palazzo della Signoria, and after being confronted, Francesco would jump from the Palazzo's ramparts, trying to avoid Ezio. Eventually, Ezio would catch him and end Francesco's life. Shortly afterwards, Ezio would meet with Lorenzo at the Ponte Vecchio, where after discussing their family's shared history, Lorenzo would clear the name of Auditore and give Ezio the name of the conspirators that escaped, along with the Codex page. After translating this Codex page, Leonardo da Vinci would give Ezio a new hidden blade that would disperse poison. When Ezio returned to Monteregioni, he would place the Codex pages with the others that they had collected. Mario would start to see a prophecy about a vault being opened by a prophet who wielded two pieces of Eden. Ezio would train with Mario until they learned that the conspirators that had fled Florence were in San Gimignano. Ezio then would spend the next year to hunt down Antonio Maffei, Archbishop Francesco Silviati, Bernardo Berencelli, and Stefano de Bayone, all of whom would lead Ezio to eavesdrop on a meeting between Jacopo de Pazzi, Rodrigo Borgia, and Emilio Barbario. This meeting took place on January 3rd, 1480. After mortally wounding Jacopo, Rodrigo would call out Ezio to have him captured, but while Ezio would escape this predicament, Rodrigo and Emilio would escape, and Ezio would put Jacopo out of his misery. Over the next year, Ezio would inform Lorenzo the downfall of the Pazzi and then travel with Leonardo da Vinci to Romagna. Arriving on March 3rd, 1481, Ezio would find that the ship required a pass, which would lead to Ezio's first encounter with Caterina Sforza, who would talk to the ship captain about letting Ezio on board after he had saved her from being stranded. After landing in Venice, Ezio would start to scout a way to get to the Emilio and would be entangled with the local thieves guild ran by Antonia de Maginas. Over the next four years, Ezio would train with the thieves to learn better free-running techniques and to put in place a plan to remove Emilio Babargio from power within Venice. This plan would culminate on September 11, 1485, with the death of Emilio and would learn the name of the next target, Carlo Grimaldi. Three days later, Ezio would spy on a meeting that consisted of Carlo, Silvio Babario, Marco Babario, Dante Moro, and Rodrigo Borgia that revolved around poisoning the doge, Giovanni Massenego, and replace him with Marco Babario. That night, Ezio would use Leonardo's flying machine to infiltrate the Palazzo Ducal. Failing to get there before Carlo had poisoned the Doge, Ezio would then chase Carlo while he yelled that Ezio had killed the Doge. This though would not last long as Ezio would then assassinate him quickly. Just before Ezio would flee as the most wanted man in Venice, he would take a codex page from Carlo's body that Leonardo would decipher a few months later and give Ezio the hidden gun attachment for his hidden blade. On February 15th, 1486, Leonardo would tell Ezio that Cristina was in Venice for Carnival. Ezio would arrange a meeting while masked by impersonating her husband and then kiss her in an alleyway. When she realized that Ezio was not her husband, she would reject Ezio, telling him that he should not have let her get married if he still loved her and asked to never meet him again. Ezio would then go and steal a golden mask to enter a party where Marco Babario would be speaking and use the hidden gun to kill him during a Carnival fireworks display. On July 11th, 1486, Ezio would find out that Silvio Babario and Dante Mora were held up in the Arsenale with an army of mercenaries. And with the help of Bartolomeo di Alviano, Ezio would be able to kill both men before they were able to board a ship to Cyprus. On June 24th, 1488, after almost two years of searching, Rosa, a local thief, would tell Ezio that the ship that left for Cyprus would arrive on the next day. On this day, Ezio would watch as the ship came into port and unloaded its cargo. When following it, he also saw that his uncle Mario was following the cargo. Eventually, Ezio would take the place of the courier and find out that it was intended for Rodrigo Borgia. After a short duel with Rodrigo, he would call for backup, causing Mario Auditore, Antonio Maganes, La Volpe, and Bartolomeo di Alviano to help Ezio with the battle. Eventually, the battle would end with Rodrigo fleeing, and Ezio would also see that Sister Teodora, who he had met recently, and Paola would arrive along with Niccolo Machiavelli, who informed him that it was Ezio who was the prophet, and that everyone present were themselves assassins. That night, Ezio would be inducted into the assassin order in a tower near the Ponte di Rialto. Ezio would then take the artifact from Cyprus to Leonardo da Vinci's workshop, calling it the Apple of Eden. Ezio would accidentally activate it, and after deactivating it, Machiavelli would tell Ezio to take it to Forli for protection. On July 7th, 1488, Machiavelli and Ezio would arrive in Forli with the apple, and after Ezio saved Caterina Sforza's children from the Orsini brothers, that of course would end with both of the Orsini's dead, Ezio wounded, and the complete loss of the apple. Ezio's trip to Spain in 1491 is currently ambiguous with its canosity, though during this trip he would save a few assassins 
he would find that Tomas de Torquemanda was working under orders of Rodrigo Borgia, leaving the local assassins to keep an eye on him. After an extensive search that would lead him through Italy to find out that the lost Apple of Eden was in the hands of Girolamo Savonarola and was being held in Florence. Arriving on February 7th, 1497, Ezio would spend the next two months removing Savonarola's nine lieutenants, weakening his hold on Florence. In the early months of 1498, Ezio would come across the dying Manfredo Sauterini, who was Cristina's husband. Manfredo would tell Ezio that men had attacked his home and that Cristina fled with the guards in pursuit. Eventually, finding a mortally wounded Cristina, Ezio would kill the guards in pursuit, and then when he offered to get her a doctor, she declined and asked him not to go. Stating that she wished they could have a second chance, she would die in his arms, with Ezio stating that he did love her. On April 8, 1498, a mob had gathered around the Palazzo Pitti and forced Savonarola to come out. This mob would carry him to the Palazzo della Signoria, and on May 23rd, another crowd would gather to burn him at the stake. Ezio would put Savonarola out of his misery and then give a rousing speech. He would take the Apple of Eden back to Monteregione, where he had collected all the pages of Altair's Codex. Sometime in 1499, the assassins would gather, and using both the Apple and the Codex, would find out that the vault that was alluded to within the Codex was under the Vatican. Now, Rodrigo was Pope Alexander VI, and Ezio would head to Rome to assassinate the Pope. Reaching the Sixteen Chapel on December 28, 1499, the Pope would be giving a sermon while holding the papal staff. After a battle where Ezio finds the staff is the other piece of Eden that is required to open the vault, the duel would commence that Ezio would eventually lose, and then he would come around. He would find that the Pope had opened the vault. After another duel where Ezio would win, he decided to let the Pope live and then would enter the vault to find a message from Minerva where she would explain that she was of a race that came before and Ezio held out the apple that she would mark it and show Ezio the history of humanity. Ending with her telling one of Ezio's ancestors that he needed to find more temples to the confusion of Ezio. When Ezio left this vault, uh, he would find that the Pope was gone, and when he tried to retrieve the staff, it would sink under the floor. I think we're going to end here for this week, as there's just so much that is known for Ezio, and we start to see a transition within the lore from his attitude, where he goes and what he does after meeting the Pope here. He is completely different from before to after, and you can name the change in his personality from his defeat to the Pope and meeting of Minerva. Some also claim that it's the death of what he thought was his one true love in Christina Vespucci. But either way, it is here where we really see that Ezio changes his perspective on life. So in our next podcast, we will discuss the latter bits of Ezio's life and get into what I think about him. And of course, thank you for your time. Please feel free to subscribe to the podcast. And you can find me at Twitter at visions underscore AC. Until next time, my assassin friends, make sure to follow the creed. And to those Templars listening, may the Father of Understanding guide you.